All right, everybody, welcome back. We just got done talking, or I should say we got done. Last, the last video, we talked about uh, psychiatric rehabilitation, particularly diagnosis and the mental health community and treatment and how that works. And we covered a lot more like the functional implications of mental health disorders. A lot of those are more focused on some of the more serious ones. And now we're going to talk a little bit more about functional implications of individual or specific diagnoses, not sort of this general conversation. So that's where we're going today. Uh, let me click the buttons, do the thing, and we move on. Okay. So you're going to get a lot of this information in other classes and other places too, but we're going to talk about uh, some of the specifics of what anxiety is and other disorders too what anxiety is and what to do about it and what the sort of various presentations are. It's kind of an overview of the different categories in the DSM and different kinds of conditions. Not all of them, but some, okay? So generally speaking, in this very broad sense, anxiety-related disorders are primarily characterized by fear and this fight-or-flight response. We have these, this arousal system in our brain that says, okay, danger, watch out, there's something to be afraid of, and then it makes us do things like um, engage in avoidance behaviors or engage in conflicting behaviors. There's all kinds of interesting, weird, strange, unusual, and helpful, and sometimes frustrating things that happen, right? When we have, uh, when we have to talk to our bosses about, you know, getting a raise, we get really nervous and we say, I would rather just not have this conversation, avoidant behaviors, because it just makes me so anxious on the inside, right? Uh, and, or for example, uh, I have to talk to my boss about my, about getting a raise. And instead of just being respectful and making a good argument for why I deserve it, I say, I deserve it. Dang it. You're going to give it to me because I've been with this company for blah, blah, blah. And it's just like getting in that fight mode, getting mad and angry. It's just a response to this anxiety that we have on the inside. And there's a million examples of how this happens in our lives, right? It's just part of our functioning mental health or mental disorder or not, it's just sort of the way we work. Our maturity and our uh, growth in life has a lot to do with how we can manage these fight or flight responses, at least from a therapy perspective, how we manage the fight or flight responses so that we can get along with other people and also get along with ourselves, make better decisions for us in our own good interests, like taking care of our health and then the health of relationships with people around us, that kind of thing too. One of the things that happens, though, is if we get so stuck in that place of flight or fight or frozen um, and fear becomes kind of just like impregnated in so much of our lives, then it, we can get these somatic complaints. We'll talk more, more about somatic disorders in a little bit, too, but it can, anxiety is one of those where it can really show up in physical ways. Okay, So let's talk about the family of different diagnoses or disorder categories, and we'll explain that a little bit more. Panic disorder um, is something that happens where people experience anxiety and they kind of live a pretty high level of anxiety, but it doesn't show up in like the constantly being afraid. Somebody might be, um, might show up as being uh, less nervous, less scared, less fear most of the time, but then have these really intense situations where um, they get panic attacks, right? Um, and Oftentimes, it's like this periodic thing that can last for a little while or can last a long time. Sometimes they get so intense that uh, they can, you know, lead to ER visits. And sometimes when people experience them for the first time, they're like, I thought I was having a heart attack. And then they go in, the doctor does some tests and says, no, your heart's fine. Sounds like you have a, having a panic attack. And then you go to a counselor and learn about what all this stuff is. In these situations, we have like this sudden rush in our in our uh, fight or flight system says like, you know, starts all the bells and whistles are going off and it says, OK, we need to be afraid here. There's something really big and problematic going on. And it just creates these fear associations with something that gets triggered somewhere in our life. We don't often know exactly what that is. We don't necessarily know what the triggers are. Sometimes it's possible to know that, but sometimes we don't. And what often happens is the panic attack itself is not really the bigger problem. The bigger problem is saying, okay, I've had this really uncomfortable experience and it was like a panic attack or something, even if I don't know what it's called. I had this experience and it happened when I was at Walmart. So I am not going back to Walmart ever again. <laughs> or it happened when I was talking to this person. 
or it happened when I was driving my car or whatever. The panic attack may not be the, the most intrusive thing in somebody's life, but then what follows is these avoidance behaviors. I'm never going to Walmart again. And so, uh, you know, other people are going and you're like, no, you can go. And then you miss out on that relationship. Or uh, it happened in my car and I'm just going to quit driving as much. I just don't, I don't do the driving thing because I'm worried about how it's going to make me feel. So it's that other lifestyle stuff that often comes as a result of panic disorders that creates uh, further complications or issues. So in some cases, you might treat the panic disorder itself. In other cases, you're talking about all the avoidance behaviors that come along with panic disorders, or that could be true of a lot of these anxiety disorders in general. Is you treat the avoidance, you treat the fight, you treat the freeze, you treat all that kind of stuff, um, but it can look different like these other ways. Agoraphobia, oftentimes this is characterized or the way we talk about it is like um, fear of leaving the house. That's how I've heard about it the most. However, it's not necessarily just fear of leaving a home. It's leaving safe spaces. So the fear of being trapped in uncomfortable situations, home is a safe place where you're not going to be uncomfortable. And that's where it kind of gets this association. But agoraphobia can just be that like, um, if you have panic disorders, and then you start avoiding situations or people or whatever it is, these unsafe situations, the panic disorder itself might develop into an agoraphobic kind of situation where, where you, uh, you know, you're constantly on the lookout dodging other people or the things because you're afraid they're going to be harmful or difficult. And what this can look like is, you know, for people when it gets to be more intrusive in their life, it's like, I'm not going to go travel to see people. I'm not going to go to the grocery store. Um, unless it's like three in the morning, um, I'm not going to. And so just like it changes the whole way your lifestyle um, gets arranged. Um, and so that's agoraphobia. Specific phobias, they can be anything that can be kind of mild, mildly annoying and kind of silly. Like, oh my gosh, I don't like spiders. Someone come and save this me from this spider. <laughs> There's all kinds of funny videos on the internet of people like, you know, in their pajamas, holding a broom up to the wall because there's a spider on there and then the spider falls and everybody freaks out. And it's kind of like, we, we sometimes think these things are funny, right? <laughs> Apparently I do. Um, all the, we all have these situations where we're just like, I, I wouldn't say that I have a lot of these, but when an insect lands on me, I know that most of these bugs are not gonna hurt me. In my head, I know that, but it just gives me the willies. And so for a second, I have these like really like, just kind of freak out moments. One time my wife called me at two in the morning when we were dating. Uh, this is before she's my wife. She called me at two in the morning to tell me that she thinks she has a wood tick on her head and she needs me to drive an hour to come take it off. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, no way I'm not driving an hour to come take a wood tick off, right? But the fear that like, I can't touch this thing. I don't want to deal with it, whatever. Sometimes it can be mildly silly. In other situations, it's not so funny. Um, it can be very limiting to a person, right? Like, I live far away from my family, but I just, I hate airplanes, and I don't want to be on them. I cannot get near them, and so I'm just not going to go. Um, that can be hindering to a relationship, right? Like, it's a pretty obvious one. Um, fear of heights, fear of, there's all kinds of phobias. If you take any Latin word and put it before the word phobia, there can be a fear of just about anything, and people make these up all the time. Um, but that's what a specific phobia is. The other category of phobia that uh, is more common and uh, that counselors end up seeing a lot are these uh, social phobias. So um, also known as social anxiety disorder. When fears specifically involve being around non-specific people, so we're talking like groups of people or crowds of people, or there's all kinds of different ways in which social anxiety can show up. Um, it can show up in all kinds of different age groups, you know, from like, you know, I don't want to go to school because I just hate being around all the people because they're kind of mean. And while that's true, then you miss out on educational opportunities, that kind of stuff. Um, so you'll see lots of social phobias and you'll learn to see what that looks like and how it presents itself. But it's just, it lives in this area of uh, people freak me out and I'm going to avoid them. Um, it tends to look more like avoidance behavior than like the fight behaviors. I go out and I get mad and start fighting with people. Then it, then it, uh, it can still be a social phobia or a social anxiety, but it, but it doesn't, it, we tend to look at those more as like kind of conduct disorders. Um, kind of. 
Okay, I'll take that one back, actually. I don't think that's necessarily always true, but sometimes it can be. In other words, if you see, this is a presentation that happens with men sometimes, where instead of getting sad and avoidant, we'll get angry and annoyed and irritated and frustrated. So you'll see people like on the highway flicking everybody off and, you know, just like, just, just pissed or complaining to managers, like, you know, those kind of people. Um, sometimes that's a result of, I'm afraid of these situations and I don't know how to deal with them because something's making me really uncomfortable. It's not just about like being untreated fairly, but some people just come in and just, you know, geared up to, for a fight. Uh, a lot of that has to do with potential fears uh, that they might have or discomforts that come from that. So the presentation of men and women can look a little bit different, but uh, same same foundation here. Uh, and then the book mentions that the, the same stuff we just talked about in the last unit about SSRIs or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors that are uh, used instead of benzodiazepines. I mentioned that kind of in passing in the last chapter that uh, we talked mostly about the antidepressants and the mood disorder medications but then we just sort of briefly said anxiety medications like benzodiazepines are you know can be addictive and can be abused so ssris are one of those classes of medications that can be used for anxiety disorders that kind of thing okay let's talk about ocd this is one of those terms that i think gets kind of thrown around too much people can flippantly say like oh my gosh i'm so ocd today and it just doesn't work that way <laughs> we all kind of know that we can have obsessions without them being unhealthy and intrusive in our lives. We can be compelled to do things without it being unhealthy, unhealthy in our lives. Obsessive compulsive and related disorders are those conditions maximized to a degree that it becomes intrusive in our daily lives or limits our ability to do other things that we need to, something like that. And we can characterize these by uh, talking about the need for control. Okay, so, but let's just get some terminology out of the way. Obsessions are just persistent thoughts that keep coming back over and over and over again, and I can't stop thinking about this. Think of like the first time you were in love and you just cannot get he or she out of your mind because like they just, you know, all day in class, you're like, screw physics, I'm gonna write my, <laughs> this person's name in my notebook. That's an obsession, right? Or uh, sometimes uh, in terms of our clinical counseling world, an obsession is like, I can't stop thinking about that argument that I had with that one person or that thing that happened to me over there. I'm just like, it's stuck in my mind and it won't go away. Uh, a s songs get stuck in our mind and we get obsessed with them. It's just that kind of uh, normal brain behavior that gets um, compounded, something like that. And then compulsions are just persistent actions that we do over and over again. So. When, in terms of OCD, we often hear people say, like, I have to wash my hands a hundred times or flick the light switches or touch this tree before I leave. Or, like, there's all kinds of uh, behaviors that happen as a result of this stuff. But we're talking about the thoughts won't leave my head and I can't stop myself from doing this action over and over again. That's what we're talking about with OCD. Um, the strange thing about these is that the compulsions themselves can appear to be purposeless and meaningless. In other words... We don't necessarily have an explanation of why somebody has to wash their hands. They might, we get the whole germ thing, but other times there are these, uh, there are these situations where somebody, uh, you know, has to flick a light switch three times and three times exactly. And it's just persistently over and over and over again. They have to do just that, right? Why do they do that? It seems like there's no practical function. However, at one time there might have been a meaningful association, you know, and sometimes it's really hard to piece these apart, and most of the time it really doesn't matter. Um, if somebody says, like, I don't know why I do this, um, but, I don't know, like, there could be, you know, one time they left the house and they thought, oh, I felt like someone was behind me, so I flipped the light on and I had to check. And then I shut the light off and I just had this sense again, like this hair in the back of my neck stood up, so I had to flick it on again. And, like, you can imagine how a story can be developed, one that's not consciously available to us, but, uh, you know, these seemingly meaningless actions can have associations somewhere. Now, here's the kicker. We don't really always care what that association is. We don't have to go back and investigate and find out exactly what happened to lead to the situation. The treatment doesn't work that way. Sometimes we can talk about, like, I'm just afraid of the germs, and the germs, so I have to wash my hands multiple times. 
even still talking about why, you know, the, the source of that may or may not be the treatment. The thing to understand about OCD is that uh, sometimes you can treat a person by sort of logically arguing your way out of this, but that's not really usually that helpful. Oftentimes, what comes along with that is the anxiety that comes with like, oh, okay, I got to leave the house, which means I have this whole routine that I have to do. People get kind of frustrated with that experience if they're aware enough of their obsessions and compulsions. Um, or you'll be talking to somebody else who lives with them and they don't acknowledge that they have this you know, need to control the routine because of the fears that are sort of deep inside that they don't even really know are there. Um, but the partner is just embarrassed or ashamed, or maybe the person sort of recognizes it, and they're like, I don't, just, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to deal with this. I don't, I'm going to avoid the situation of, of talking about these things that I know that I do, but that I'm embarrassed about them or ashamed. Those can be like sort of the secondary stuff of counseling that we, that we work with people. Um, the need to hide. This is another place for the... By the way, OCD kind of lives in this family of anxiety disorders. The need to avoid those conversations about the behaviors they know are going to lead to conflicts and they're going to feel uh you know challenge their self-esteem that kind of stuff so i think that's enough said about those but um okay let's talk about trauma and stress related disorders these can have mood components they can have anxiety components but they are unique enough and uh common enough that they they weren't their own category so we're not going to talk a lot about attachment and those kind of trauma-related disorders today. We've talked about that in the past, and we can talk about it in the future. You'll talk about it in other, pl other places. But right now, we're talking specifically about like single events or repeated events or something like that. Um, there is this uh, obsessive component to PTSD, uh, a persistent recollection of an event. So sometimes it's triggered by a thing, you know, the classic example is the car backfires and the, the veteran experience is going right back into that military event again. Um, or I see somebody that resembles my abuser from when I was a kid and it brings me back to that place. It's that obsessive thought that come, comes around. Sometimes it comes around during waking hours. Sometimes it shows up as nightmares in our dreams. But either way, it's just present persistently. Um, the difference between this and kind of like that compulsive OCD behavior is instead of um, compensating for that fear uh, or dealing with that uh, obsession that we have, um, instead of like doing these other activities, it tends to sort of put our mind back in that place. It increases our body's response to anxiety or, or stress. So like the fear response physically comes up. So we're sweating, we're panicking, we're getting really nervous. And, and we're having these persistent thoughts of that event, we're reimagining our abuser or that situation that we were in, uh, in our Humvee or whatever it is, and we're sort of reliving that event. event. In other words, the body is sort of go, instantly go, triggered to go into overdrive, and what happens is sometimes eventually that overdrive leads to this sort of shutdown, and we just like become incapacitated. Either we detach emotionally, um, we, we get have a fight response instead of a, that emotional avoidance we have this fight response we get kind of like all keyed up to go do something really wild or like i have to just go yell in my garage or whatever there's all kinds of things that people do but that's the body sort of coping with like you know there's just too much going on in here because of the memory that i'm that i'm having here's an example imagine you have a car with faulty electronics um and sometimes what happens with faulty electronics is the computer will tell your car to idle really high. So you get in your car, and normally it just goes, hmm, <laughs> whatever a car sounds like. I don't make a very good car impression. But uh, if you've ever had a car like mine, I've had some pretty old cars in my life, some junkers. And you get in the car, and it turns on, and it goes, Aah! and it just kind of idles high. In other words, the body system and the car both think, hey, I need to put in a lot of energy here and pump in the fuel and pump in the air and just be ready because something's going to happen. He's going to slam on that gas pretty soon and I need to be ready to, to go fast. The, the body and the car are both in overdrive, not because they need to be. They're idling. They're just sitting there still. But then something happens that says, like, okay, you need to be in overdrive. Eventually, that engine's going to wear out. It's going to say, I'm just like, I can't be in overdrive all the time and it's going to shut down. 
And that's what we're talking about here a little bit too, is that there is the actual event of post-traumatic stress where people are like, they're triggered, they're in that really panicky, bad place, and they're just like freaking out. I got to deal with this. But what then happens is then after that, we avoid going into those situations where there might be a car backfiring. We avoid going into those situations that are going to make us really uncomfortable. Our body says, I can't handle being in overdrive, and it has this automatic response of dissociative or dissociation, where it just kind of detaches from itself for a while. You hear the experience sometimes of people who have uh, been through sexual assaults, where they literally have this, like, I'm leaving my body because I have no other way to cope with this. I'm going to, you know, even to the point where, you know, sort of so detached from their body that they can kind of feel themselves hovering over their their empty body laying on the ground and sort of they're outside of it. That's part of that dissociative stuff. So all these uh, experiences that come as a result of the PTSD gets triggered, the body goes into overdrive, and then it shuts down. Sometimes you're treating the shutdown and sometimes you're treating the overdrive. It really just depends. Um, but that's how these are different than anxiety disorders. Anxiety disorders might turn into panics and that's that kind of overdrive, but it's anxiety disorders are like more of a low level, just kind of chronic constant hum of high idle or high fear situations. So hopefully that analogy makes a little bit of sense. Um, and you can kind of see how these are classified a little bit different. Um, depression can follow as a secondary condition. That's probably pretty obvious. We can talk about that more later if you want to. Another thing is that somatic uh, conditions can follow. That's probably true of any anxiety disorders. Somatic just means body stuff. So people complain of like, my stomach hurts. Um, I have chest pain. I have chronic, you know, when, when we're kind of tense and just always like in fear, our muscles can get tense and we get knots in our back and so we get pinched nerves and all kinds of stuff. Wild stuff can happen as a result of just not being at peace and not being relaxed enough. <laughs> so um, there's all kinds of ways to deal with that body stuff from uh, yoga to meditation, to prayer, to physical exercise that actually stretches and uses our muscles. All these things are really helpful to manage anxiety as well as therapy. Therapy is one of those parts of healthy living. And by the way, when I say therapy, I mean therapy is an artificial relationship to substitute for uh, not functioning or inappropriate relationships in most of our life. We have relationships with our therapist to talk about how we can balance things out in our real life, but it's a temporary solution. It's just like, I'll take meds for a while to rebalance the chemical system in my body. I'll do therapy to rebalance my relationship and my social life with the hope that I can get more balanced and, and do it better independently myself later. So um, anyway, that's a rabbit trail we could go down. Okay, let's talk about uh, depressive disorders. Now we kind of get away from that anxiety family and we're moving now towards more uh, depressive disorders, a change, change in atmosphere here a little bit. There are a lot that fall into this category. Um, others like bipolar, schizophrenia, those two are just like post-traumatic stress. They're unique enough to justify their own category, but they still live with some of the same symptomology. So we'll kind of talk about some of that crossover. That's one of those things you'll get with experience, just you'll see how, the, um, how they can look look similar in certain ways, but are different enough also. Uh, major depressive disorder is probably the most common one that you'll see when people, this is another one of those things like when people say, oh my gosh, I have OCD right now. <laughs> or like people will use the word depression when they really mean sadness. So they'll say things like, I just feel kind of depressed. I'm just blue, I'm down, I'm just, you know, I'm not feeling myself lately. However, major depressive disorder is a specific condition that's characterized by some very specific symptoms. Hypersomnia, sleeping too much. Hyposomnia, not sleeping enough. Could be either one of those things, which makes it kind of confusing, hard to spot sometimes, but it could be either. Feelings of wor worthlessness and guild. <laughs> that's a typo, I should say guilt. Um, guilding is not part of this. Sounds like something people do in the Middle Ages or when you play World of Warcraft or something. <laughs> some video game thing. Uh, fatigue is common, you know, not necessarily, it's not necessarily the same as like sleeping too much. It's just like a constant tired. I feel constant tired, like constantly tired these days, but that's because I don't sleep enough, not because of sadness. But when sadness is a part of our life, 
we just get this, you know, uh, just, I don't have the energy to get up and go out. It's just part of the condition. Lack of concentration, uh, loss or increase of appetite, psychomotor agitation, which means just like kind of a always feeling on edge. Sometimes this can look like anxiety, but it can look like depression too. And this is where it's the uh, uh, clinical acuity or being able to spot the difference between um, anxious movement and depressive movements. Um, that's part of, part of what we learn uh, as, as counselors. And then suicidal thoughts, of course, is, is part of this too. Um, and that's probably its own little conversation that can be had another day. The one thing I want to mention about uh, lack of concentration is some one of the things when we talk about medications, one of the things that can happen is people feel like they lose some of that concentration. This is one of those pro and con balancing kind of things where if people come in and say, the medication makes me feel kind of funny and I just have a hard time functioning. Um, I, I never, I was on, uh, let's see, I've only taken one medication. It was escitalopram. Uh, and that one... I didn't necessarily feel this, that, that it sort of made me foggy, but some people experience that side effect. Um, but this is one of those conversations that you can have in counseling of like, well, what is it like to be off medication and have low motivation, lack of concentration, not being able to function at work versus going to work with a little bit of fog, but at least you're at work and you're functioning. How, what's the difference there? How do you experience that kind of stuff? So, um, this, this one is a is a hard one kind of for people to spot because it's hard to tell the difference between this like fatigue, lack, uh, lack of concentration, lack of motivation, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then what's the medication related side effects that come along with that. So anyway, just a side note. Um, another uh, depress the condition that falls into the depressive disorders is persistent depressive disorder, which used to be called dysthymia. Dysthymia is kind of like a for lack of a better term, a low-grade depression that is longer-lasting and more present. Um, it's sort of like, when we talk about most of these conditions, we're kind of looking for two things. Is it, uh, does it fit the time criteria, or is it frequent enough? So, like, it has to be for this amount of time, or it has to start but before this age or something. Like, it has to meet that time criteria. Uh, so, is it long-lasting enough, and the intensity of it? So the duration and the intensity, those two things, duration and intensity. Most disorders have their own, um, they will comment on how long a thing has to happen or, you know, especially when you think about like bipolar, how many times have you had your depressive cycles? How long do your depressive cycles last? Have you had your depressive symptoms for two weeks or more over the course of the last six months? All these kind of things are related to timing and then intensity or intrusiveness in our lives. Those are two things that happen or that we, that we pay attention to. When it comes to persistent depressive disorder or this thing we used to call dysthymia, it's like the, the symptoms aren't really that intense. You don't have these really, really intense intrusive suicidal thoughts. You can get out of bed, but you're slow. You're just always tired, but not enough that keeps you from really doing stuff, but just everything looks kind of gray all the time. The classic example of dysthymia is sort of the Eeyore. If anybody knows, I'm realizing I'm dating myself now. Uh, Winnie the Pooh was a Disney character that was kind of, uh, I knew him when I was young, but I don't think people know him as much these days, but Eeyore was this guy who's a little donkey, who just was always sad, just kind of a bummer. And when you're around people like this, you get the sense of like, it's almost this contagious feeling of like low energy where you're like, oh, that guy is just a buzzkill, just a bummer. Like it's always negative, kind of crabby, but not to the point where it's like, it seems like it's a crisis situation and there's never really anything you can put your finger on that that is going particularly poorly in this person's life, that kind of thing. And that's why here I write, it almost looks like a personality type more so than an actual mental health condition. And oftentimes people get that, uh, they inherit that self-concept and other people know them as that kind of person because it is so persistent. So it's a little trickier to, to kind of spot and notice, but um, that's one of the conditions. Um, one thing I think is worth mentioning too is that Depression can look so different from so many people, and it can it's not really a clinical distinction here, something you'll find in the DSM, 
But sometimes it can be helpful to think about these things as like the high functioning depressive and the low functioning depressive. Just like uh, something I think is more common for people to hear about is high functioning alcoholics. You can be a closet alcoholic, go to bars and not be a closet alcoholic, be like out in public or in private, whatever. And you can drink a lot and still go and accomplish a lot of things and perform really well and do a lot of that stuff and kind of live on this. I've been using this phrase a lot lately. I'm not sure why, but you live this high octane life. You, you work hard, you party hard and that kind of stuff. Um, same with depression. Somebody can have a whole bunch of sadness, compartmentalize it and not deal with it. Um, but in their personal life, they can really, really be hurting. So just because you see people, professors, uh, grad students, doctors, lawyers, politicians, all these people with like high intensity, high stress, high power jobs are uh, just as if maybe even sometimes not a little bit more susceptible to depressions. Um, and there are the people who are just like, I can't do it. I can't get up. I can't get out and I can't go to bed uh, or I can't get out of bed. Um, so it can be helpful to think about these in these, both these ways because sometimes you'll get people who are like, I can't be depressed because I'm doing so well in life. And you'll find them in treatment, but usually they're a little more reluctant to come in and they don't really understand that depression can look like this stuff. Um, and then there are other disorders too. Nothing more to say about that, I guess. <laughs> there just are more. Um, this is a kind of a smallish list of things that you might see in the DSM. Continuing on with other depressive disorders, there are two types of bipolar. Bipolar one is characterized by um, only mania without the depressive episodes. Um, the confusing thing here, and this requires a lot more uh, training, but a bipolar one person, it's primarily categorized by mania. It can include depressive episodes, but doesn't need to. So what we're really saying here is the mania is the really... Uh, the more intrusive, more difficult, more challenging thing. There's all kinds of stuff about the distinction between bipolar one and two, about uh, when is when is the onset, um, and then how, how it presents itself. So there's all kinds of other things to know about this. It's not just those two, but that's kind of a basic introduction about it. Bipolar two usually includes cycles of mania and depression. Those cycles can happen, they can be short cycles, and there can be long periods of time in between them. They can be long cycles with short periods of in time, in time in between them. There can be all kinds of ways this shows up in a person's life. Um, and so uh, it can be kind of challenging. And this is one of those disorders that gets misdiagnosed. Um, and you'll hear a lot about it because we're still kind of trying to figure this one out. I think we know a lot now, but we're still trying to figure out how do we treat it? How do we recognize it? Um, and there's still work being done about this. Although I think we're kind of maybe on the backside of really, um, I could be totally wrong about this. Maybe I shouldn't even say it, but kind of on the other side of really feeling that we have down the, the criteria for understanding what it is. So I don't anticipate a lot of changes happening with this one, but that doesn't mean there's, there's still, uh, it's not confusing because there's lots of different presentations of it. Think like there's the autism spectrum disorder. We're not talking high functioning, low functioning like we do with, uh, ASD, but we are talking about just different various ways in which this shows up, especially given that depression can look different in men and women. Men get angry, women get sad, <laughs> just generally speaking. Um, so much more to learn here. Uh, a word you'll hear oftentimes, not only in relation to bipolar one or two, but you'll hear this word hypomania. Hyper means excessive or more of. Hypo means less than. So like um, hyperinsomnia is excessive sleeping. Hypoinsomnia is uh, not sleeping enough. Hypomania means it's a milder form of mania. So let's talk about mania just for a second. Um, I don't want to go too far into this, but this is kind of a confusing one for people. Things that mania can look like in your life are um, excessive spending, excessive sexual activity, or more than normal, I should say. Not necessarily excessive, but just more than a person's norm. Um, it can look like periods of enhanced creativity, uh, sleeplessness, where you just don't sleep that much for certain periods. It could mean like no sleep or two hours of sleep for days on end, um, and then a big crash afterwards. Um, it can look like uh, impulsive behavior. Uh, so like, I'm just gonna take a trip. I wasn't planned it, but I'm just gonna go, <laughs> something like that. It can look like all kinds of different things, but it's just like erratic in ways that is not the norm for somebody. 
and then particularly like enhanced uh, energy. And one of the things that happens, I think, did I say this? I don't know if I said this in here, but one of the things that happens sometimes is that people will go through their depressive episodes and they recognize that as being problematic and terrible and they want treatment for that part of it. But when they're manic, they have this sense of power and the sense of like, I can get so much done. My house is always clean when I have these episodes or, you know, I'm a writer and I can write 50 pages a day if I have, if I'm manic. Uh, and then I will go through periods where I can't write for a long time or something like that. The periods of mania, mania can be intoxicating and people can love them and really not seek treatment because they miss the opportunity to be so productive and so feel so strong for a period of time. So this is one of the things that makes it really challenging. Hypomania being just milder um, is a little bit uh, less recognizable for people, but they still have that sense of like, I just I kind of like this because I feel good for a while. I'll have this period of like, I feel fine now even though later on they're like, but my bank account really suffers and relationships with people around me really suffer. And that's when they're like kind of weighing out. Do I want to feel like this at the expense of all these other things in my life? So anyway, um, these are individual, like many disorders. Yes, of course. I just explained how they can be different for everybody. Um, sometimes there's more mania, sometimes more depression. Sometimes they're longer lasting, sometimes short cycle. Okay, I already said that. Another condition, uh, cyclo cyclothymia, kind of like dysthymia in, this, in the sense that it's sort of this low grade, uh, characterized by hypomania. If there is mania, it's hypomania. Um, and it's just more of like this chronic long lasting version of bipolar, but doesn't reach the duration and intensity that's required for a full diagnosis of bipolar one or two. So cyclothymia is just kind of like uh, all the things that I said about dysthymia and being difficult to spot, kind of more like a personality characterization rather than a, than a condition that's outside of a person's personality. This is, this is what we're talking about here. Um, they're sometimes the most difficult to understand because you have to really understand historical behavioral patterns. And sometimes the clients themselves are not always the most reliable narrators of their history um, or record keepers of how long things last or how how it affects other people or that kind of thing. So um, they can be really challenging to diagnose because you can't just like see it as a presentation in front of you until you know a person over time, see them in those different cycles. And so that's one of the hard parts about it. It's just challenging to really conceptualizing conceptualize what does treatment look like. And because you might see somebody during their depressive episode when they come in and you say like, hey, well, let's treat the depression. And then you totally miss the mania part of it uh, because either they don't recognize that as being part of any condition or you just don't see it and you, you know, make a rush judgment. So sometimes when people, you'll see people um, acquiring a diagnosis later after they've already had some other diagnosis and sort of uncovered that, hey, this is kind of a problem. Or they go to a counselor, this thing happens. They go to a counselor, they'll get diagnosed with depression and they find themselves in the ER and in the, during their uh, manic episode and then the, you know, this, this co coordination and collaboration between um, ER psychiatrists or psychologists or something, and then uh, coming into to routine therapy and sort of just trying to figure out, you know, what were you in the ER for again? How did this happen? Where did this come from? <laughs> just, it's confusing um, and difficult, especially when somebody's coming in for outpatient therapy once a week and just, and then you have to wait another week or whatever it is until you see them again. It can be just a really challenging thing. So. Anyway, um, almost all people with bipolar uh, engage in pharmacological interventions, or in other words, they take medicine um, in addition to therapy, too. So that's sort of a, one of the reasons why it's important to understand these medications and some of the side effects, because a person that has fatigue from a medication is not the same as fatigue from depression. However, they can look the same exact way. That's where it gets really challenging, is saying, like, is this fatigue from the meds or is this fatigue from depression? Or does it even really matter? And we just have fatigue to deal with. So let's, let's figure out how to live life despite the fatigue, that kind of thing. Um, the last thing I want to mention about bipolar 2 is bipolar 2, um, in a different way than bipolar 1, bipolar 2 is the most life-threatening disorder of all the mental disorders. In terms of like suicidality, the impulsivity and the suicidal ideation, particularly with males, make 
a male with bipolar 2 the most serious and the most potentially life-threatening. Um, more people die with this disorder due to suicide than any other disorder. And so it's not something to be taken lightly at all. Um, and when you're doing an assessment and trying to understand a person, even if you're doing, one of the things I'll, I'll typically do is if I suspect major depressive disorder, I'll always ask about suicide because it's part of that condition. But I'll always ask questions about impulsivity, even though impulsivity is not one of the criteria for depression, because I want to sort of rule out the potential for if this person is super depressed and is having suicidal thoughts and they have means and intent and all, you know, all that stuff, depending on where they're at. If I want to know if they're going to have these periods of impulsivity in which they're going to be a risk to themselves. And then we'll talk about what that means for them. So it's worth mentioning that because uh, it is something to be taken very seriously. Oh, there's more. Okay, so well, let's talk more about bipolar then. Um, often, I think I've mentioned this kind of already a little bit, but often it's diagnosed after long periods of loss chaos, desperation, people come in kind of at the end of their rope, not like, oh, I really have a good understanding of my condition. If they do, they've probably seen other therapists and been through treatment before, but sometimes you'll get people who are like, my life isn't shambled, and I don't understand why. I'm not drinking, I'm not doing all these things, just like, just, I don't get it, you know? So sometimes you have to help people put the pieces together a little bit. Uh, med adherence is a problem because of that, like, I feel fine now, I'm in between cycles so I don't need this anymore or I'm manic and I'm just I'm done with this crap I don't need it anymore I'm powerful I'm strong I can deal with this myself and so med adherence is a big challenge with people until they've had enough of those periods of lost chaos desperation where they say like okay yeah I get, I get it I've got to I've got to do things that I don't feel like doing um and this I guess this is where I talked about uh periods of, of mania and people in, liking that increased ability to be creative and be productive and all that kind of stuff. That's where I use my stupid term again. It's a high octane lifestyle. <laughs> not dissimilar to being a teenager. Okay, that's maybe not totally fair. But when we are teenagers, we have big egos. We have uh, very high ideals about who we are and who we should be and who other people should be. Uh, very idealistic. Um, we are, we feel like we're oftentimes more powerful than we actually are, then the sky's the limit, we can accomplish anything, just dream big and all that kind of stuff that, you know, that teenagers have. Um, it's kind of like that when people are manic too, is they sort of re-look really like they have that teenage confidence, that kind of thing. Um, that's why, I, that's why I make that claim. So I, I don't mean to be flippant about it, but it's just, <laughs> I guess I just had this moment when I was making the PowerPoint slides and I thought it made sense to me. If it doesn't make any sense, well, we'll just forget about it. Don't just ignore that I said that. Um, the vocational impairment in terms of uh, how do you do vocational rehabilitation with somebody with bipolar, oftentimes it just comes from like the erratic behavior that come with the onset of a manic episode. If a person doesn't realize well enough yet uh, what their behavior looks like when they're starting to become manic, then they can show up at work and say, no, oh, I'm not quite there yet to where it's really problematic. And they show up to work and then they have these like whatever the episode looks like. I'm like super fast and fidgety and productive. I can, just, I can work for hours and I ask for overtime and I want to do like multiple shifts in a row and just, it, and then you have a breakdown and just, it becomes a mess. So missing work uh, due to illness, either the depressive episode part of the cycle or the manic episode, both can be challenging. Okay, let's shift gears again. I got to check the time, 43, all right. Schizophrenia spectrum and psychotic disorders. Now these are disorders that I have probably some of the least familiarity with. Um, so I can't really talk a whole ton about, about specifics here. Um, but there's a bunch of different kinds of diagnoses that fall under this category that look very much unlike other things, although they might have mood components with them or even anxiety components with them. Schizotypal personality disorder, delusional disorder, Brief psychotic disorder, schizophreniform disorder, schizophrenia, and schizoaffective. All of these things have unique and subtle differences. Um, the manifestations of that, and we're going to talk about, you know, how these fit. These all fit in different ways and show up in different ways to look like all these other things. So we'll talk about this, uh, the, the symptomology and not the conditions individually like they have been. So it's slightly different than how we've been talking about the other stuff. Um, delusions are just beliefs that have no grounding in reality. Examples are thought broadcasting, that other, the things that I'm thinking other people 
are, they, they just know it. We do this all the time, by the way, when we're in close relationships with other people. Sometimes we say, like, when we're, we're dating people, we're like, they just know my thoughts. Or you hear this with, like, twins and siblings sometimes. They'll say, they just know what I'm thinking before I even say it. And some people are like, yeah, there's something to that. But this is, even if there is something to that, this is in a condition where there's probably not a very close, intimate relationship, but I still think that you know what I'm thinking. I'm putting thoughts into your head, something like that. Thought insertion is something kind of like that where I think somebody is inserting thoughts into my head. So, um, you know, like you're, in one case, I have power over you, like this telekinesis to like put thoughts into your head. In another case, it comes to me. Um, ideas of reference, delusions of grandeur, paranoid delusions, these are all things that categorize this kind of like uh, a non-grounding in reality. This is another one of those areas to be really careful with because it can be really tempting in kind of like an, an unfortunately normal way to assume that we know about other people and how they are connected to reality. Because we all have our own perspective and counselors are no different than anybody else. We have our own perspective of what normal looks like. And this is where we spend a lot of our work time is saying, I understand what normal and helpful parenting patterns look like, relationship patterns look like, um, societal functioning, vocational functioning, all this kind of stuff. We say we have a sense of what normal looks like and mental disorders are often categorized by what falls outside of that version of normal. And so when it comes to connection to reality, you'll hear people make comments like this all the time, especially when you're talking about like politics. He's not connected to reality because my version of reality looks so different than his. <laughs> you never hear it like that. But that's kind of what's going on. Um, I'm, not, I'm not being pessimistic. I'm just being realistic. Well, realistic to me might be very pessimistic to somebody else. This is where it's really challenging to talk about delusions. Oftentimes, there are very clear breaks from reality. Like when I say, there's an alien in the corner of the room and he's putting thoughts into my head and he's telling me to do things or something like that, right? Um, that's a delusion. Uh, but we throw around this word like you're just acting delusional, you know, that kind of stuff, probably in a dangerous way, <laughs> more often than we should. Um, so we'll leave it there for now. But um, these, are, these are examples of that sort of extreme version of detachment from reality. By the way, this is a little bit different than dissociation. When we were talking about dissociative qualities before, that's sort of like, um, and we'll talk about it a little bit more in a, in a bit, but dissociative, dissociative experiences are more of like, I'm removing myself from my experience of myself. Delusions have a little bit more to do with beliefs that are um, outside of our own human experience and beliefs of an external world as versus kind of our internal world. So they're slightly different, but we're kind of talking about the same thing of like not experiencing life the way it's supposed to happen, something like that. I don't know, that might have just been more confusing, but. Um, hallucinations, these can be any kind of sensory experiences. You know, you've hear, heard about like hearing voices, um, seeing things that aren't really there, kind of like mirages. That's something, a hallucination that most of us experience when we look off in the desert distance or something. Although that has a scientific explanation to why that happens. Um, sometimes uh, we see people having hallucinations or we, we know what hallucinations are, at least just in a general sense. <laughs> There's nothing more to say about that. Also, one really interesting thing is that hallucinations are pretty common with Parkinson's disease. Um, I've heard people talk about, like, white rabbits. Um, it's not just a Matrix thing. <laughs> you ever seen the movie The Matrix? They talk about white rabbits. Um, people with Parkinson's can sometimes have these experiences of seeing things out of the corner of their eye. Uh, and that's just a normal part of the Parkinson's experience, at least for some people. Um, so it's not just people with schizophrenia that have hallucinations. There's other conditions in which it's present, too, but we just don't hear about those as much. Um, the other thing, too, that's relatively common is uh, sensation, uh, hallucinations of sensation, so skin crawling, feeling like there's bugs underneath the skin, something like that. Um, there's all kinds of ways in which our body can experience things that we think are there but really aren't. Um, yeah, there's nothing more to say about that for now. Disordered thinking. This usually comes in the form of speech. So disordered thinking is hard to spot when someone's just thinking a thought. But when they're talking about their thoughts, then you can kind of see what's going on in their mind. Um, there's lots of different ways that this can present itself. Just a couple of them are this, this idea of word salad. 
Um, it's people putting together words that just do not even fit and don't make any sense. I wish I had one thing you might do is if you want to Google uh, or go to YouTube and just Google like word salad, schizophrenia, whatever, you'll find examples of what this sounds like. And I'd love to show you some of those. We still have time to do it. Um, pressured speech. Um, that sometimes is used as kind of a generic term. You'll hear in like a mini mental status exam. If somebody comes in and you can see that I just got to get so much out of here and they're talking so fast as if it's like being pushed out of them. That's what pressured speech is. Um, but that, uh, there are kind of two ways to think about it. And I guess they don't want to go too much into the details. Let's get too far into the weeds. But pressured speech can be um, sort of an initial impression of somebody, but it can also be um, something that's kind of a longer lasting thing that's just part of a person's condition. Oh, it might not always be fast, but it always just feels like there's really pushing to get words out. And this takes a lot of energy. So this has to do with disorganized thinking because like, the thought is there and I have to grab onto it and, and say it really, really get it, like just really take a lot of energy to get it out. So something like that. Um, also diminished emotions. So like, you know, blank, blankness, abolition. There's a couple words here that are a little confusing. Abolition, anhedonia, elogia, and asociality. There's, the book has good definitions of all these. Abolition is like, I'm just not feeling very motivated. I can't get up and actually like do things on my own or take initiative. Anhedonia is like lack of feeling or lack of affect. So just like kind of looks like fatigue, I guess. It's just kind of like down and low and quiet and still and that kind of thing. Um, and you can look up the rest of them, but there's just, it's one of the things to understand about this too is that when you look at the DSM and when you hear uh, stuff from other professionals, particularly if it comes from a medical perspective, you'll hear a lot of Latin sounding words to explain things that we have normal English words to, to say. So it's almost like tr one of the things I do as a teacher is I just translate these words into things that other people will understand. And you as counselors, you'll have to translate those to You'll use word, one language that you've learned in grad school and elsewhere to speak to other professionals, and you'll use another language to speak with clients. We've talked about that before, but this is an example of some of those things. Okay, um, I'm just going to check how we're doing here. Holy crap. Oh, man. Looked on, got too far. Got too excited in my clicking. Okay, uh, I'll speed up a little bit. Management of schizophrenia spectrum and psychotic disorders. Medications, of course. Therapy, not as much, but can depending on the severity or spectrum of the expression. So if somebody's actively psychotic, medications are really their own only source. That does not mean that they can't benefit from the presence of somebody who's safe and kind and gentle and not judgmental and all that kind of stuff. That can happen. But providing therapeutic interventions is just not going to work the same way. Um, Group therapy can be really good, particularly social skills training, uh, self-esteem therapy, family therapy for the people that are living with somebody with these conditions. Support groups can be really all helpful. So all these things are options. I won't talk about those too much right now just for the sake of time. Med compliance is also an issue here, not for the same reasons that we talked about in, in uh, bipolar, because in mania there was like this sense of like, I don't need meds anymore, I'm healthy. When it comes to this stuff, it's more about like, um, I just, I, in some of the psychotic disorders, it's like, I don't need this stuff. You're using this to, to, in, uh, to change who I am. And this is going to kill me eventually. It's like a little bit more of that paranoia. It's not a sense of power, but more, usually more a sense of paranoia, something like that. Um, another one that I think is really important to add here, and I'll, I will take some time to explain this. Advanced care directives can be helpful, not only with uh, schizophrenia, but lots of different kinds of disorders, particularly ones that are more severe and more long lasting. And by severe, I mean, if there's a potential that somebody could find themselves in the ER for a depressive episode, um, a manic episode, a psychotic episode, any of those kind of things where judgment is an issue, an advanced care directive can be helpful. So what is an advanced care directive? Advanced care directives gives the power of medical decision making to other people when somebody is incapacitated. So you'll often hear about these kind of near the end of life, um, end of life issues when dementia sets in or potentially Alzheimer's or somebody's in a coma. Then there's a legal representative to make medical decisions that's supposed to belong to the individual. 
if a person knows they have these periods of mania or they're going to find themselves needing inpatient treatment at some point because of severe depression or because of uh, a schizophrenic episode or psychotic episodes, during times of health, that person can say, when that happens to me, I really want you to not give me this one medication because the doctors in that hospital, they don't know that I'm going to respond to it poorly. They might know that I, which ones I'm allergic to because they're used to asking that. But my mom really knows, and she's the one who's kind of my caretaker, and my counselor really knows. So let's get this all in writing about the, the medications I want, the ways I want to be treated, things to not say to me that really piss me off, <laughs> that kind of stuff. It just it informs people about the kind of care that's helpful for you so that you can uh, carry that with you and make sure they know. So an advanced care directive can be a really helpful thing. It's kind of new to the counseling field. In fact, let me show you something. Um, this book right here, um, The Center Cannot Hold. This lady named Ellen Sachs, she's, uh, what, is, what is she? She's got like three PhDs or something, and she's an attorney or something like that, but she also lives with schizophrenia. And this is a book that describes her experience of schizophrenia. And she was the first person I heard about this, and I think kind of the driver of like, these are these advanced care things are really, really helpful and important for people to uh, to consider because of because of the way people are treated when they're not known and their conditions are um, just misunderstood, that kind of thing. So uh, something to look into if you end up working with folks like this is learning how to do that. Um, Call an attorney and say, do you have experience with these? How can I apply this to my clients? That kind of stuff. Um, you can totally help with the process, even though it feels like a legal thing. Um, there's nothing, some people can get kind of nervous about this because they try and avoid lawyers as much as possible. But these things are one of the ways. And there are many ways that lawyers can be incredibly beneficial to us and our clients. Um, this is one of those ways where it can be really helpful. So if you're working with anybody with these conditions, something to consider. Um, Self-harm is a greater risk than harm to others. I don't want to go into that too much, uh, but I'll just leave it there. One thing, uh, I know we're kind of cutting close on time, but I, I do want to share this with you. Um, I used to work at a group home with four ladies who had um, serious and persistent mental illnesses, particularly schizophrenic types. So um, when we say, like, these are kind of scary, and I don't really understand them, and I'm kind of it just seems dark in the, the Hollywood conception of what schizophrenia looks like. It's like a horror movie. It's, it can feel like that to some people. And it can, there are scary parts of this. But those ladies were some of the most fun people I've ever worked with. And it was the most functional group home I've ever worked at. And the owners of it were fantastic. And we would, I mean, with, with, it was so much fun to work there. Because like we'd go on vacations. And we'd go like do fun things all the time. And it was just kind of normal that like we'd have conversations about, I think the neighbors were coming into my window last night and they were in my room again. And, and we'd have that conversation over and over again of like, um, the, the neighbors are elderly and they can't really get through the windows. And let's go check the window to make sure it's locked. Cause I think you locked it, right? And then, yeah, yeah, I locked it, okay. And it's just having a lot of conversations about some of those fears and paranoias. And like, I'm hearing the voice again. And we say, oh, what's the voice telling you? Okay, let's talk about that, you know? So uh, in terms of therapy, you're not, the goal is not to make these things go away, uh, but the management can be, well, how do we still live our life? Okay, this is a really hard time right now because you know, I'm, I'm feeling the, this, the hallucinatory sensations. And we say, okay, well, let's just put our shopping cart over here and let's just go kind of hang out and rest for a few minutes and I'll, I'll talk with you for, during this thing. Um, one lady hardly ever came out of her room, but she, when she was doing well, she would, she was so grateful to us and, you know, cooking her dinners and stuff. And she would look up from her meal once in a while and smile at us. And we'd say like, is it a good day today? And she's like, nah. It's all right. Well, it's good to have you here. That kind of stuff. So, uh, it can be scary, but it can also be incredibly wonderful to be around some of these people. So it's important to, to mention that, that when we spend all this time talking about the dark and the dreary. Um, the experience of these folks is not always like that. So, Okay, uh, we've talked a little bit about somatic symptoms, so I won't say exactly what those are because we mentioned that. Um, it's when people go in to see their doctor and there's no medical foundation that oftentimes they'll come to us only to find out that there's some sort of anxiety-related thing going on. There is a specific somatic symptom disorder 
uh, that term, somatic symptom disorder, used to be called uh, hypochondriasis, and that's one of those like pop culture terms that a lot of people know of. You're just a hypochondriac. You always think you're sick and there's something wrong with you, um, even if there's really not. Um, but it, this is the technical term that we use now, a somatic symptom disorder. Um, illness anxiety disorder is like a lower grade version, same way I've been describing the lower grade versions like cyclothymia and dysthymia. Um, illness anxiety disorder is a very similar to that. It's like there's body stuff, but it's not constant complaining, but it's like, I just never feel well, that kind of thing, but there's really no medical reason for it. So, uh, that's, that's a thing. <laughs> Conversion disorder, losing voluntary motor and sensory function without biological foundation. I'm just going to skip over that one for now, just for the sake of time. Factitious disorder, um, voluntarily producing symptoms to appear sick. Now, some, something that you, that some people have heard of before, or you will hear of in the future is this word malingering. There's a difference between factitious disorder and lingering. In factitious disorder, there's no real motive, or there's no real incentive. With malingering, it's like, I'm going to pretend I'm sick so that I can get an insurance claim. I'm going to pretend I'm sick so that I get attention from other people. I'm going to pretend I'm sick so I can get out of doing something, get out of school, you know, like fake a sick note or something. That's malingering. I never really thought about that before, but kids are constant malingerers, aren't they? They're always trying to get out of stuff by saying, I don't feel good. <laughs> Here's my doctor's note or whatever. Um, but it, in there, there's like an ulterior motive or an incentive to do something. With factitious disorder, it's just lying for lying's sake and saying like, oh, I don't feel well. And there appears to be no motive. They're not attention-seeking. They're not trying to get something. It's just They just are doing that for whatever reason. We've already talked a little bit about dissociative disorders, but uh, they're a little challenging to understand. It's characterized, and I quote here, the book actually quotes this, so it's a secondary resource. Disruption or discontinuation of normal integration of consciousness, memory, identity, emotion, perception, bodily representation, motor control, and behavior. So, like, everything, basically. <laughs> In other words, when I said earlier, it's we have this normal experience of life, and dissociation is kind of going outside of that somehow. And I made the distinction also of, like, um, there's these uh, delusional things, which has a relationship with, like, our external reality, things outside of us, dissociative uh, things that have a uh, broken relationship with our body, and all of these are parts of our body, motor control, our behavior, our emotions, our perceptions, all that kind of stuff. So people will talk about dissociations in lots of different ways. And I gave you a few examples, but um, here are a couple more. Um, tunneling of consciousness. Have you ever got really nervous uh, before a job interview and then you just feel like your brain is kind of shutting down? It's kind of like that. That's a slightly different thing, but it's kind of like that where like I can't, I have no understanding of things that are going around me and I can only see this one thing right in front of me, something like that. Um, but the difference between like just general nervousness and anxiety is that in these cases sometimes you can be very very clear and perceptual of that one thing whereas when you're nervous you're just like oh my brain is shutting down and I don't it's foggy and I don't understand things whatever. Um, lack of connection to the present moment, non-emotionality, and normal emotional producing situations, etc. There's a whole bunch of examples of what that can look like. Dissociative identity disorder, or what we used to call split personality disorder, really fascinating, really interesting. I have nothing to say about it right now, but know that it exists. <laughs> that's, that's good enough. Dissociative amnesia. Uh, amnesia can happen for all kinds of reasons. We've talked about it uh, in the presence of a traumatic brain injury. Uh, but dissociative amnesia means I have no memory but no apparent reason why. Um, there doesn't appear to be a physical precursor. Sometimes this can be, dissociative identity can follow up, follow traumatic events. So PTSD with, with dissociative amnesia uh, along with it, something like that. Um, depersonalization and derealization. These are just other terms. These aren't like specific conditions, I think. I have to check up on that, but... I don't think these are specific conditions, but they're just terminology we use about detachment from mind, body, or identity. That's depersonalization. It's confusing because that's kind of the way we talk about dissociation. So there's that. <laughs> We'd have to dig into this a little bit more. And detachment is detachment from surroundings. So remember I made the distinction about detachment from self and detachment from external things? 
this is kind of what we're talking about, just different language to apply to the same thing. Okay, personality disorders. Uh, these are really popular and people get really confused about what these are. And as counselors, you're not going to see them as much as compared to other disorders, but you will see them. Um, but they're challenging, challenging to understand, and they require a lot of extra training and, and learning and that kind of thing. When we're talking about personality disorders, everybody's got a personality, and these are the unhelpful deviations from cultural norms, and they tend to be pervasive and inflexible. What I mean by that is people can be quirky and weird in this like not normal way, and that can be perfectly fine and perfectly healthy. But then there are these really not helpful ways. When we talk about the different diagnoses, you see, you notice that there are 10 different types of personality disorder. We're talking about, um, some of these are right below here. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. But when we're talking about these, they're really unhelpful and they uh, impede a person's social functioning, ability to maintain relationships. Um, they tend to kind of leave a wake of destruction behind them wherever they go, that kind of stuff. Um, so people like to use these flippant, this is the risk of it, is that the reason I say they're complicated is because they really are. And people like to say, oh my gosh, you're such a narcissist. And there are certain personality characteristics that all of us have that are egotistical and self-centered and narcissistic, but that doesn't mean it translates into a clinical disorder. And it's a really important distinction to understand because it takes a while to really get good at this. I would not be comfortable diagnosing somebody with one of these diagnoses right now. I think it would be uh, Im unethical probably um, and immature for me to do that. So um, I'm really, really careful and I think most of us typically are um, but not everybody. So that's why I'm saying it out loud. Uh, it can be really tempting sometimes to say there's just something seems kind of dangerous about this person. They feel unsafe and here's all the reasons why and they kind of have an impression like this kind of person. Maybe they have this disorder, um, but be very careful with these kind of disorders because um, not only, well, I'll just, I'll leave it at that. You can push the person away. You can uh, uh, start uh, having a lot more counter-transference if, if you're experiencing this kind of thing. So dealing with our own counter-transference is kind of an advanced skill. That's why I say it's really hard to treat people like this sometimes if you don't have the skill set yourself to be mature enough to deal with high conflict situations. Sometimes people just really avoid treatment this way if they can't handle that kind of stuff. Um, I think I kind of already mentioned this, but Oftentimes, these are just extreme, the, the, the characteristics of personality disorders are extreme versions of things that are normal for all of us to have. I mentioned narcissism already, but lability, uh, uh, labile impressions, for those of you that haven't heard this term, being labile means having emotional fluctuations that are extreme and kind of rapid. So like, if I'm uh, having periods of high lability, I might be happy one second and really sad the next. It's normal to have feeling changes when the environment or circumstances uh, demand that, but it's not normal if you're like, you walk in and you're like, oh, I'm so glad to see you. You're my therapist and this is gonna be so much fun. And then you talk for five minutes and you're like, okay, this is gonna be hard because I'm gonna challenge you sometimes. You're like, you can't challenge me, how dare you? You know, like uh, going from just like all over the place, all over the board, somebody. And I guess even that was a probably bad example because I, was the environmental factor that imposed a change and then that person had a reaction to it. In some cases, you'll see people just be like all over the board for no apparent reason. Happy, sad, mad, glad, just like all over the place. Um, we all get avoidance sometimes. Remember when I talked about that anxiety? Uh, it's just sort of a normal part of our fight or flight response. Um, unhelpful, but normal. These are extreme versions of that. Antisocial. Um, not just being like, I don't want to be around people because that's kind of normal. That's okay for especially the introverts of us. We just kind of want to get our breaks from people. But antisocial is not just getting away from people. It's an active distrust of others. Having a distrust of others can be helpful when there's dangerous people, but it's not helpful if you distrust so people so much that you just have all this anger and rage and, you know, uh, just naughty behavior as a result of it. And then histrionic. This is one of those terms that doesn't get a lot of talk, but histrionic kind of means, and this is another area that I would not consider myself an expert in understanding what this means exactly, but it's basically attention seeking behavior and oftentimes uh, attention seeking in the way of like uh, sexual deviance. Uh, that's a bad way to put it. Um, I use my sexuality to get attention from other people. So um, 
it's not just sexual behavior, but it's like excessive attention seeking. And like the whole world revolves around me and I want everybody to know it no matter where I go. That's the sort of histrionic impression that I understand. Um, okay, I already mentioned that last piece. Neurocognitive disorders. Uh, I don't think we've necessarily covered these in other places, but they're part of the DSM. But these, this is the, the territory of a neurologist. This is what neurologists do, is they do tests, and they are medical doctors, specifically because counselors don't, will deal with the secondary conditions of things like Alzheimer's disease, or, you know, global intellectual decline from dementia or something like that. But we don't really diagnose these things. So uh, I'm going to kind of cover briefly move past this. We could have a whole class period talking about dementia and Alzheimer's disease and what that means for treating families experiencing those, but it's not something that we're going to talk about the condition itself because there's really no specific therapeutic treatments from counselors for things like dementia. It's not totally true. There are therapeutic, depending on the, the stage that they're in, um, but nevertheless, it's just not something I'm going to choose to spend time on today. Um, the presence of delirium or dementia with no organic factors present. Um, the book talks about that. I don't remember what she said, <laughs> what they said about that. Um, but sometimes like a neurologist will say, okay, we're, you know, there was a stroke or there was this physical event that happened. And we can see now as a result that the, there's a decline in, uh, memory and understanding and cognitive functioning, all that kind of stuff. But sometimes it just happens. And so uh, sometimes we're talking, when it comes to a neurocognitive disorder, sometimes there's an organic reason for it in brain change, and other times it doesn't appear to be one. We don't really understand what's going on. Um, so I think that's the point there. Um, oftentimes they're secondary to other health conditions. Um, and de delirium, in terms of counseling, one of the places you'll see delirium as opposed to dementia and Alzheimer's is people experience delirium when they're withdrawing from alcohol or other drugs. Um, it's this sense of like, it's not a hallucination. It's not like I'm seeing things. It's just kind of like a confusion and like a, I'm kind of lost and like get really tangential, meaning like my attention can be all over the place and I can talk about really weird things and I'm just, I'm just sort of like, detached from reality in a different way than delusions. Delusions are like beliefs about other things that don't match external reality, but delirium is just kind of like a loss and incoherence, maybe another way to put it. So that's where that can show up a little bit more. Okay, uh, we're over time, but I think we covered a lot of really important ground today. So um, thank you for sticking it out and hopefully it was uh, educational and interesting. <laughs> so I'll see you later. Bye-bye.